Secret codes have been at the centre of events throughout history. Wars have been lost, governments deposed and monarchs executed, all because their codes have been cracked. But code breaking can also be about knowledge and enlightenment. In the 19th century, scholars attempted to decipher the hieroglyphs of ancient Egypt. Although not written as a secret code, all knowledge of what they meant had been lost. Unraveling these messages from the ancient world would be one of the toughest challenges codebreakers ever faced. For over a thousand years, the hieroglyphs of ancient Egypt were a complete mystery. Then the discovery of this stone in 1798 started an extraordinary intellectual race. Jean-Francois Champollion in France and Thomas Young in Britain both believed that the Rosetta Stone, as it was called, held the key to deciphering hieroglyphs. But the Rosetta Stone did not yield its secrets easily. For two decades, it would tantalize and frustrate two of the most brilliant men of their time. I've come to Egypt with Dr. Bill Manley, an authority on hieroglyphs, to find out how scholars got to grips with this long forgotten script. We've come to the tomb of Ramesses VI in the Valley of the Kings. So the sarcophagus gets brought down here. Yep, this is a, a ramp for sliding the sarcophagus all the way to the burial chamber. Early Christians had forbidden the use of hieroglyphs, believing them to be pagan and sinful. As the centuries passed, all understanding was lost. Some scholars argued that hieroglyphs were a phonetic script, just like our alphabet. Others believed it was nothing more than primitive picture writing. Now we're in the actual burial chamber of Ramesses VI and we're surrounded by really mysterious scenes of the king's rebirth. And these are surrounded on all sides by hieroglyphic text. Now after the 5th century AD, people couldn't read these texts anymore. So they looked at the scenes and saw that the scenes were mysterious and obscure. And so they assumed that the hieroglyphic script was mysterious and obscure in itself. So the pictures convey vague ideas of enemies and capture and rebirth and so on? Yeah, the scenes look mysterious, but the hieroglyphic texts are actually there to make clear what they're about. European interest in deciphering hieroglyphs took off when Napoleon arrived in Egypt in 1798. His primary motive was military, but he took with him a team of scientists, surveyors and draftsmen who catalogued everything they encountered. This was a scientific mission to gain the knowledge and wisdom of the ancient pharaohs. Within a year, they made an extraordinary discovery. Whilst enlarging a fort in the small port of Rosetta, French engineers discovered a stone bearing a unique inscription one that would rapidly intensify the race to decipher the hieroglyphs. But their triumph was short-lived. The stone was confiscated by the British after Napoleon's defeat in Egypt, brought back to London and eventually erected in the British Museum. And this is it the single most famous slab of rock in archaeology. And what makes it so remarkable is that it has the same piece of text repeated three times in three different scripts. So at the top, we have the mysterious hieroglyphs. In the middle, we have demotic, which is a sort of shorthand version of hieroglyphs. And at the bottom, down here, we have the Greek. And of course, scholars knew how to read Greek. Therefore, they knew what the Greek said, Therefore, they knew what the hieroglyphics said, and therefore they hoped they'd be able to decipher the meaning of individual hieroglyphic symbols. Unfortunately, it wasn't quite as simple as that. 
First of all, there was the problem of how to match Greek phrases to the appropriate hieroglyphs. Scholars simply had no idea which Greek words corresponded to which symbols. Secondly, most modern scripts are alphabetic. Symbols represent sounds. But the hieroglyphs bore no resemblance to any known alphabet. For a start, most alphabets in the world typically have about 30 letters, whereas there are over 700 hieroglyphic symbols. The alternative to an alphabetic script is a pictographic script, in which symbols represent not sounds, but ideas. So the hawk hieroglyph would represent the idea of a hawk, or the idea of flying or speed. But this didn't make sense either. Many hieroglyphs on the Rosetta Stone are pictures of birds, but the Greek text, which states it is a translation of the Egyptian, never mentions birds or anything remotely connected to flying. In fact, it's largely about taxes. Far from being the key to hieroglyphs, the Rosetta Stone seemed to make matters even more confusing. It took a genius to make the first breakthrough. In 1797, a medical student arrived at Emmanuel College, Cambridge. Thomas Young was an extraordinary polymath. He tried to explain what causes the tides. He studied acoustics. He studied what things do when they bend and stretch. He even invented a machine for measuring tiny distances, such as the width of a hair. He was fascinated by the human eye, how it perceives the colour of light, how it focuses light. He was even interested in the very nature of light itself. Thomas Young is one of the most acute minds I think this country has ever produced. He's simply a genius. What motivates him is curiosity about almost anything in the real world. He's ever asking questions, writing out things in his textbooks, uh, crossing them out and doing them again. In order to try and get to the root of the mystery, he was essentially a person who liked solving problems. When it came to the problem of the Rosetta Stone, Young used an old codebreaker's trick. He looked for a so-called crib. A crib is some small piece of the hieroglyphic text that you already know the meaning of and which you can then use to start deciphering other hieroglyphs. Young noticed that within all the hieroglyphs, there are some that are surrounded by a loop, such as these hieroglyphs here. It's called a cartouche. Now, he assumed that these hieroglyphs must represent something important, perhaps the name of a king. Now, one king mentioned within the Greek is Ptolemy. So perhaps this cartouche reads Ptolemy. Now, this is really important because not only have we matched up a piece of Greek text with some hieroglyphs, we also know how these hieroglyphs are pronounced. Ptolemy is pronounced the same whether you're talking ancient Greek or ancient Egyptian. The cartouche contains eight hieroglyphs. So could it be a word made up of eight letters from some mysterious alphabet? Young's stroke of genius was to take the cartouche and to assign a sound value to each hieroglyph to spell out the name Ptolemy or Ptolemaish in Greek. So let's have a go. The square must be a P, the semicircle a T, the noose an O, the lion an L, the hair clip an M, the double feathers an E, and the hook an S, so that we have Ptolemesh, Ptolemesh. Now, in hindsight, we know that Young did make one or two mistakes, but in general, he got the right sounds for the right hieroglyphs. But Young himself could not be confident about the accuracy of his work. 
the next step should have been to cross-check his decipherment against other cartouches. But suddenly, he abandoned his research. He believed that the name Ptolemy was merely an exception. It was only spelt phonetically because it was a foreign name. He felt that for traditional Egyptian names and for all other Egyptian words, the hieroglyphs behaved as pictograms. One symbol represented one word. What Young had done was to show that some hieroglyphs, some of the time, were phonetic, were an alphabet. He was tempted to believe that this was simply something that happened very late on in the history of Egypt. After all, they needed to write funny Greek names like Ptolemy or Ptolemaios. Young had made the first breakthrough, but he had guessed the meaning of just one tiny set of hieroglyphs. The rest of the stone, as well as the writings of an entire civilization, were still a complete mystery. Progress on deciphering the hieroglyphs was proving slow and difficult. Scholars had theories, and some even declared that they had cracked the code, but they were wrong. Young's work was sent to Paris for evaluation, and among the scholars who received the paper was the brilliant linguist Jean-Francois Champollion. Champollion was a child prodigy. He could read Homer and Virgil at the age of nine. At the age of 10, in 1800, just after the Rosetta Stone had been discovered, he met the secretary of Napoleon's mission to Egypt, Jean-Baptiste Fourier. Fourier brought back dozens of wonderful relics that fascinated the young boy. However, Champollion was puzzled. What was the meaning of the strange symbols that adorned the pieces? Fourier explained that nobody could read these strange symbols. At that point, Champollion declared that one day he would decipher the hieroglyphs. The young man had mastered 12 languages in order to mount his attack on hieroglyphs. Champollion was initially convinced that hieroglyphs were not an alphabetic script, and even released an article saying as much. When Young's work on the Ptolemy cartouche came to his notice, Champollion did an about turn. He changed his mind, but without mentioning the influence of Young, and even tried to destroy all copies of his article. He decided to adopt the alphabetic approach, and, more importantly, he tried to extend it to other cartouches that had just been obtained from Egypt. He started with the most famous Egyptian queen. So here we have a cartouche of Cleopatra, and just as we did with Ptolemy, we've associated a letter with each of the hieroglyphs. What Champollion then did was to cross-check between the two cartouches. So, for example, in Ptolemy, the P is represented by a square. In Cleopatra, the P is represented by a square. In Ptolemy, the O is represented by a noose. In Cleopatra, the O is represented by a noose. This level of consistency showed that Cleopatra, like Ptolemy, was written phonetically. But Cleopatra was also a foreign name, so critics still argued that everything else was just picture writing. The debate was eventually settled, thanks to an inscription found at the temple at Abu Simbel. Champollion received a copy of reliefs from the temple in September 1822. The temple has four giant representations of a pharaoh who towers over the landscape, facing the rising sun at dawn.
the pharaoh was obviously important, but nobody had any idea who he was. The secret lay in his cartouche, as yet undeciphered. A copy of this cartouche ended up on Champollion's desk. Now, not surprisingly, he tried to decipher it, but he didn't have much luck. He knew that the N2 hieroglyphs represent the sound of the letter S. The symbol appears in the name Ptolemaeus. So we have a double S or Cs, but he didn't know the meaning or the sound of the other two hieroglyphs. At this point, Champollion made a remarkable intuitive leap. He'd been studying Coptic, the language of the Coptic Christian church, the Egyptian Christian church. He theorised that Coptic, being the oldest surviving spoken language in Egypt, would be related to the way that ancient Egyptians spoke. Other scholars had advanced the same idea, but none had the linguistic skill or knowledge of Egyptian culture to show how it could work in practice. He knew the first hieroglyph represents the sun god. In fact, at the top, you can see the sun. The Coptic word for sun is ray. So now we have ray something sees, ray something sees. Well, Champollion wondered, perhaps this represents the name of the pharaonic king Ramesses or Ramesses, the great pharaonic name Ramesses. What's remarkable about this is that Ramesses is a traditional ancient Egyptian name. It's not modern or foreign like Ptolemy or Cleopatra. And if the Egyptians used hieroglyphs to spell out phonetically ancient Egyptian names, then why shouldn't they use hieroglyphs to spell out all Egyptian words? This is the moment that the code was cracked. So hieroglyphs do behave largely like the letters of an alphabet. For example, the letter M is represented by an owl. The chick represents the letter W. And the reason that there are so many hieroglyphs is because some represent combinations of letters, syllables. This hieroglyph, a plough, represents the combined letters M and R, mer. And this hieroglyph, a game board, represents the sounds M and N, mun. Sometimes it's more complicated. This famous hieroglyph looks like a sandal strap and means sandal or unk in ancient Egyptian. But the word unk also means life, so the same hieroglyph can mean life. Or it can simply provide the sound unk as part of another word. All of this took time to deduce, but it was Champollion's linguistic skill and insight that unlocked the most difficult of all codes, a forgotten script whose key had been hidden for centuries. He was so overcome that he rushed into his brother's room and shouted, I've got it, and fainted. Champollion's breakthrough unleashed a whole new world of insights into Egypt's past. Bill Manley was keen to show me an intriguing example at Aswan. Among all the hieroglyphic texts, is there anything that's the equivalent of Samuel Pepys's diary? Not diaries as such. People don't record their innermost thoughts, but you get letters that they write to other members of their family. You get uh, notes to the milkman, if you like. <laughs> The plan of this place is the same as a typical Egyptian temple, but it's not uh, a temple for a god, it's a shrine for a human being. You can see what the real job of hieroglyphs is, and that's to explain clearly what goes on in places like this. Before Champollion's work, there was no real inkling of what's being talked about here, which is ancestor worship. Family members would gather at the tombs of their ancestors and eat a meal in the chapel that we're, we're at now. They would talk about the, the maintenance of the integrity of their family, even though a central member of their family has been taken away, the family stays together. 
ancestor worship wasn't mentioned by classical authors and therefore until we could read texts like this was uh, an important aspect of Egyptian culture of which we knew nothing. The two basic rules of reading hieroglyphs are that first of all you always read from the top downwards and secondly any sign that has a face and looks in a particular direction will always look towards the beginning of the text. We can see that the hieroglyphic text begins here and reads this way. The first hieroglyphs together we get the word imach which means a revered one. The second word here, the first hieroglyph is a ball of string which gives us the sound ch. The mouth gives us a sound r. So we have cher which means before or in front of. The third word is spelled out with two hieroglyphs. This jug here spells out the sound chenem and that's the sounds in the name of the god chnum. Chnum in Egyptian art was represented as a ram. It doesn't contribute anything to the sound of the word, it's what we call the determinative and these are written at the end of words to give you some indication of the nature of the word. So that tiny jug or vase represents a syllable. That syllable happens to be the name of the god but just to reinforce that you draw a picture of that god. So the determinatives help us, but in general, the rest of the hieroglyphs are phonetic. That's right. It emphasizes the fact that we're dealing with the ram-headed god Chnum. The revered one before the god Chnum, the lord of the cool water region, which drops down here. The chief of Elephantini, which is the name of the, the town nearby here. The governor, which is the title that this man held. And then finally the name of this man, Neb Kaurau Nacht. In July 1828, Champollion made his first and only trip to Egypt. At last, Champollion could read the hieroglyphs at first hand. Deciphering inscriptions that had previously been impenetrable. Reading new insights into Egypt's past. For example, here at Karnak, Scholars had previously known nothing about the temple's history, but Champollion, by deciphering the hieroglyphs, could tell that it had taken over a thousand years to build the temple complex. When Champollion saw the monuments for himself, he had to struggle to stop himself from weeping. The effect was overwhelming. He wrote, we Europeans are like people from Lilliput. No people, ancient or modern, have ever conceived of architecture on such a scale. So large, so grandiose, so sublime. The Egyptians, he wrote, thought like people who are a hundred feet tall. F, F, this snake here. <laughs> On returning to France, he wrote up his notes about the trip. Mary, which means his beloved. As soon as he had finished, he suffered a massive heart attack and died. Unk, the word for life. He was only 41 years old. Body. In nature, never. It was as though his work was done. He'd cracked the code. <laughs>